So um, I went through the list of questions carefully and was considering which questions I could potentially answer. Grace had circulated, circulated those earlier in the summer. And uh, there were two in particular that caught my eye that I became exercise that maybe would be good to try and provide an answer to. And so the topic of today is, is really uh, an answer, if I can, with the Lord's help, to two questions, really, that are related in a lot of ways. What is a Christian's mission in life? And how do I manage ambition? And I've put those two questions together really under the topic of purpose and success in the Christian's life. And this topic will, this talk will cover a lot of things that you're perhaps quite familiar with, but I think at the same time, maybe there are things that we don't think enough about from day to day in our Christian lives because we get busy doing things. Maybe there are things with respect to the assembly, things with respect to our families or even our jobs. But overarching everything is this key question of what is my purpose? Why do I, if I can put it this way, why do I even exist? And this is a big thing because we know that today suicides are an epidemic in the world. And young people who do not know the Lord Jesus as their savior, they live a life of hopelessness. And they live a life of pursuing this giant hole in their hearts they have no sense at all of meaning or purpose or anything else. And I think that a lot of times the Christian, and I'm assuming I'm speaking to believers here now today, uh, we, we can forget sometimes these overarching big questions in our life. And so I just wanted to just give you an example of a couple of uh, mission statements that we find in the secular world. Uh, the companies have. I'll give you a couple of examples. So Apple, I think some of you know about the Apple software company. Their mission statement is bringing the best user experience to customers through innovative hardware, software, and services. I thought of a, I wanted to have a European company in the list. So I looked up Volvo's mission statement, which is to make life easier, better, and safer for everyone. And Amazon um, their mission statement is to be Earth's most customer-centric company. And uh, just to give one more, social media, their mission statement is to give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. So these are mission statements that these companies have because they want to provide an overarching purpose for their employees and something to guide what they do in the company from day to day. A second thing that I'd like to just quickly talk about, which is related, is our identity, the concept of identity, who I am. And I think this is different from a purpose because it has to do with um, my position as a child of God. And I think sometimes... Um, understanding our identity is really a very fundamental thing in life. In the Old Testament genealogies, we have over and over again that so-and-so was the son of, was the son of, was the son of. And knowing who you were a son of uh, helped people understand what tribe you belong to, who your forefathers were, your rights as to the Levitical priesthood, your inheritance rights, all of these things. And Really, a family name was a thing of honor. You know, I come from uh, an area in Nova Scotia that is very Scottish, and my wife actually has a Scottish heritage. Her name is McDonald, and McDonald means son of Donald. And in Scotland, almost everybody's last name has a Mick or a Mac attached to it, meaning you are the son of some so-and-so. And so this just quickly leads into, you know, who I am. I talked to you a little bit about I'm Sean. I'm the son of Stan Allen. He's my father. And I grew up in 
Nova Scotia, Canada, in a town of about 5,000 people. My father was a school teacher, and I'm one of 11 children. Uh, I have seven sisters, and I have three brothers. So I, have a, I, I come from a family of 11, and I'm the oldest of those boys. And right now, I live on the island of Newfoundland um, in a very small assembly. The assembly here is in my home. Um, there's just two other families in the assembly. Um, and that's a little bit about my identity. That's who I am and where I come from, if I can put it that way. And so I just like to begin with this question of what is, we're going to come to identity, but what is the Christian purpose in life? And so I'd like to start with a verse in Colossians chapter 1 to begin with an answer to this question, which I think is very important. Colossians chapter 1. And if we could turn over to, we'll start at verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of, of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And I, maybe I'll read the next two verses. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. I just want to dwell on two words in this passage at the end of verse 16. All things were created by him and for him. Those two words. This is a stupendous fact that I was made for God. Stop and think about that for just a moment. You know, I, th I thought about this in connection with my living room. I have many things in my living room. None of them are there by accident. They're all, they all serve a purpose. At least I think most of them do. You know, I have a bookshelf. I have chairs that I sit in. There's a clock on the wall to tell time. There's plants just to provide a sense of nature in there. There's windows to see light. Everything in my living room has a purpose. It's there for a reason. And this verse says that we were created for God. Now I'd like to take this a little bit further, which an even more amazing statement in scripture, and it's beautiful, in Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation chapter 4. <clears throat> and we're just going to turn to the very last verse in that chapter. Verse 11 says this, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created this is so beautiful just think about this you were created not just for god but note you were created for and i was created for his pleasure wow like, that is just amazing. You know, I was thinking again in connection with my living room, some of the things in my living room that give me pleasure. My fireplace is probably the thing that gives me the most pleasure in my living room, aside from enjoying the company of my wife and children. I love to sit in front of that fireplace and enjoy the warmth from a burning wood in the wintertime. Well, you know, we were created for the pleasure of God. Now, you know, it, it doesn't end there. That is just a partial answer to my purpose, because God created many things for his pleasure. In fact, it says here he created all things for his pleasure. And so where I would like to turn to now is Colossians chapter one that really gives us, I think, in a certain sense, the full picture of what my purpose and your purpose is in life. So if you go over to Colossians chapter 1, I'm sorry, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, 
Ephesians chapter 1. And we're just going to look at verse 4. We'll just read verse 4 for a moment. It says in verse 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, and this is what I would like to spend a bit of time speaking about, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And really, I believe this completes, if we can put it this way, the purpose of the Christian's life. And I'd like to look at the three things that are contained in this phrase, holy and without blame, before him, in love. <clears throat> so, you know, let's just look, first of all, at the fact that it says holy and without blame. God's purpose, really we should start with the last two first. God's purpose for you and for I is that we would be created for him and for his pleasure that we could be with him, before him, to enjoy his presence and enjoy his beauty and to enjoy the Lord Jesus for all of eternity. And that we would enjoy his love in that position forever and ever. That, that is why I am made. That is why I exist. I can't think of anything that is more magnificent, really goes beyond anything we can even begin to imagine, that this is why I was made, to be in the very presence of the Lord Jesus and to enjoy the love of God forever and ever. But, you know, we want to go back to this little expression, holy and without blame. Really, this brings in the gospel message that God cannot take pleasure in something that is sinful and broken and ruined. And we know that that is what happened in the fall. And that we know that that in our state as sinners, Something had to be done about that. I couldn't be and I can't be in the presence of God to enjoy his love, to enjoy the company of the Lord Jesus, unless something is done about the fact that I am a sinner. And so in order that I could be there and be holy and without blame, God had to send the Lord Jesus down into this world to die in my place, to take the judgment for the sin that I deserved and rise again and thereby make possible for me to have a new life in Christ so that in the very power and possession of that life, I could stand before him in love for all eternity. This is just amazing. You know, if you step back and think about it, to what length would you go to come into the possession of something that you really cared about? You know, before we're married, if, if, we're, if we are married, we might go to great lengths, if we're men especially, to try and win the heart of the girl that we love. And we would give a lot to try and make that happen. Or maybe, you know, there's somebody that you care about, um, who is in a terrible position and you're willing to go to a great length to rescue them. Some of you may have heard of Focus on the Family and uh, James Dobson, who ran that program for years in the States. He had a son who was very rebellious and he wrote a book actually about strong-willed children. And his father, um, I, I may be getting these facts wrong. I can't remember if James Dobson was a strong-willed son. Um, you'll have to look that up. But his father moved. He gave up his career and he moved his whole family across the United States, hundreds of miles away from where they were living at the time in order to rescue, if I can put it this way, this strong-willed son from the environment that he was in. He sacrificed a great deal because he loved and he cared for his son. 
God did something much, much more than that. He offered his only son to die for me so that I could live. And so that's, that's our purpose in life. If I can just recap that for just a moment. I was made for God. I was made for his pleasure. I was made in order that I could enjoy the love of the Lord Jesus and to be in his presence for all eternity in a position of being holy and without blame. And so next, I would like to touch a little bit on the question of what is our identity? That's why I'm here today. That's why I'm here. But then we might ask the question, well, who exactly am I? And I, again, I think this question of identity is very, very important. And we know the answer to this question, but there are implications for the Christian life. And so I just like to put forward that we are sons of God and joint heirs with Christ. And there are many passages in the New Testament that bring this out. I'll just read one because there's so many. If we turn to Romans chapter 8, and we know these verses extremely well. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15, it says, Ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Father itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we also be glorified together. This is who we are. And, you know, there's just a few things that I want to touch on that, that are important in this connection. If I am a child of God, I am in a relationship as a son to the Father. And that relationship is a beautiful thing. We want to confide in our fathers, share with our fathers. We enjoy, as in the father-son relationship, the security that goes along with that. When I grew up and was young, I had all the knowledge of the security that my father, my dad, he was going to take care of me. He was going to feed me. He was going to look after me. And I knew that my father loved me. And so I just like to leave these three things as we walk the Christian path down here. It is very important to remember that as children of God, we have full security. We have the love of a father promised to us each and every day. And we can enjoy that relationship to go to him and not worry. We shouldn't worry about what he uh, is going to think or say about the things that we share with him. You know, that's something that's so important. I think sometimes we think that we can hide our feelings and our struggles from our father when we pray. He wants to hear about it all, all of it, because he knows it all already. What he's looking for is us to be able to open up and speak with him. And so this, this concept of identity is very important. And then last thing, because I know our time is moving on here and there's quite a bit to cover here. I just want to touch on destiny. We understand why we are here today. We understand who we are as children of God. And what is our destiny? Our destiny can be summed up, I believe, in a very beautiful verse in John chapter 17. Again, these are all very familiar passages, but they're so important to be reminded of. John 17. In the prayer, the Lord Jesus gave to his father before he went to the cross. In verse 24, it says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. You might say that this sums up almost everything that I've spoken about thus far. Our purpose, our identity, we're introduced here is in that relationship to the Father and our destiny. And what is our destiny? That we would behold the glory of the Lord Jesus. 
with him forever and ever. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the implications of this, but this is a subject I have been meditating on all year, actually. A, a, a sister wrote me a letter and she said, she asked a question. She said, Sean, what is the glory of God? And that led me on a, a study that I had never really considered before. And I won't share with you all of my thoughts on that, but I just want to, it brought to me a few things that, um, really just kind of struck me. Did you know, for example, and I'm sure some of you know this, that in the galaxy, in the universe we live in, there's estimated to be two trillion galaxies. Two trillion galaxies. Within one of those two trillion galaxies, there's 100 billion stars 100 billion stars in one of the two trillion galaxies and inside our sun which is a star there's estimated that you could fit 1.3 million of the earths that we inhabit inside the sun that's how big it is the sun which in scripture is often compared in an illustrative sense to the lord jesus himself is 15 million degrees Celsius in its center. And it provides all of the energy for the earth. And in fact, the very processes in happening inside the sun are what allow us to see the world around us right now through photons. And God made all this. And so when we think about beholding his glory, the glory of the Lord Jesus forever and ever, the absolutely indescribable, amazing thing about that is that the Lord Jesus was became a man and walked among us and died for us so that we could somehow, you might say, comprehend the glory of God. Because if he had not become a man, there was no way that we could ever comprehend the glory of God. It's far too much for us poor human beings. And so God sent his son, the Lord Jesus, into this world to die in order that we could have the means whereby we could enjoy his glory forever and ever. And that really is the meaning of the verse. The God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so coming back to this verse, the Lord Jesus prays that we could behold his glory that was given to him. And so I'm going to stop there. This is a break in my talk. This is all God's side. We haven't done anything here. Everything that I've just talked about has to do with God's purposes for you and for me. When you wake up in the morning, when I wake up in the morning, and I've been challenging myself all week on this, do we remind ourselves of these things? It's, it's just so magnificent and so, so wonderful. And so what I would like to do now is turn from God's side, as it were, to man's side. And look at it from the standpoint of, I'm living now in this world. And you might, we go back to that question, what is my mission? And I'd like to just suggest, before I enter into a couple of just very meager thoughts here today, that our mission really is that all through this life, that we would grow day by day into a deeper sense of who the Lord Jesus is. If my destiny is to behold his glory for an ever and ever, the moment I became, my sins were washed away and I became a new creation, the purposes of God are that I would begin to get to know the Lord Jesus better and better and better. And you know, there's a verse at the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that says, we all with with open face, beholding 
the glory of the Lord are changed into his image. I have to quote the verse. I'm not getting it exactly right. But as we get to know him more and more, we are changed to be more and more like him. If I could put it this way, all of life and every circumstance you go through, whether in your family or in your job or in the assembly or anything else is to this end. And this is why it is so important to have an understanding of God's purposes for you and for me. And so I really want to touch on two principles that I believe are required in the Christian walk to help us to grow in our sense of the beauty of the Lord Jesus and his love for you and me. And as I was meditating on this, I was reminded of a song and it came to me afterwards that I grew up with and maybe some of you, maybe all of you know, this is verse, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. And so to keep this easy for you, I want to introduce two thoughts here. And I'll, let me recap just where we've come from. Our purpose, our identity, and our destiny. God's side. But now we turn to man's side. And the two things I'd like to touch on are faith and obedience. And let's just turn to a verse in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, again, all very familiar verses. And it says in verse 6, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I'd just like to stop and consider this for a moment. Faith. You might say faith in a very simple sense is just trusting God, trusting the Lord Jesus. And why does that contribute to, we, shall we say, to a sense of who he is and my getting to know him better in my life? And I'm going to illustrate this with a little example. It's a poor example, but it's it help, hopefully will help you understand. And again, pardon me, these are familiar things that all of you know. But several years ago, um, I was at a Bible conference in Walla Walla. And I had gone to a Bible conference there, and I had lent my car to somebody locally who, who needed a vehicle at the time. And I well remember that in the meeting, uh, I think it was a prayer meeting before the breaking of bread, my phone started buzzing and buzzing. And it turned out that this person I'd lent my car to had got into an accident and, and ruined the car. And so when I got home, uh, I found myself without a car. And it was a topic of discussion for a while. And I remember one day my wife said to me as I was, as she was driving me to work, because I didn't have a vehicle to get to work at that point in time. Sean, you should really consider buying a truck. And um, I, I was very dismissive of it. I thought, why do I need a truck? I've never had one before. They, they're hard on gas. Uh, there's lots of things I like about them, but practically, why would I have a truck? And, and plus, they're very expensive. And that very evening, I was speaking to my neighbor across the street. And you'll just quickly see where this is going. And he had a, a burgundy pickup truck in his driving driveway. And he said to me, you know, I'm selling this truck. I, I don't really need it anymore. And, uh, um, it, you know, I'm, I'm asking a certain amount of money for it. And I was just kind of shocked. You know, it was like a rebuke. I thought I completely dismissed my wife's comment today, but here's my neighbor this very same day telling me he's selling his truck. And by the way, it was very cheap and very, very affordable. And well, it turns out I bought that truck. And that truck has been such a blessing to me in many, many ways. 
uh, been used to help people, you know, it's transporting goods back and forth. I have a, my, my wood stove and getting, getting wood and transporting it. We love to pick blueberries this time of year and there's roads we can't drive on a normal vehicle. We take the truck to do that. And you know that, and it has been absolutely, there's been no issues with it mechanically. It's been far cheaper to operate than I ever could have dreamed. And every time I drive that truck, I feel as it were like it's a gift from the Lord Jesus. And I feel a sense of his care for me. And you may say, that's kind of silly, but you know, it's just a little illustrative example of this was his gift to me. I didn't ask for it. He wanted me to have it and I've been able to enjoy it. And there are many, many examples in my life that I could give of that very same thing. It doesn't have to be material or in possessions. It could be a spiritual thing. But when we trust the Lord and just lean on him rather than taking matters into our own hands, and then we see him answer the prayer, it makes him more precious to us. And is this not why faith is so crucial to the Christian life? If my destiny is to know the Lord forever and ever, the process of faith enables that to grow and grow and grow as we walk through life. And, you know, there are many difficult ways this gets ex exercised. I have children, and I've been through some tough things with some of my children. One case in particular I can't share on the meeting, in the meeting, but I can tell you that I would spend, and my wife too, countless hours on my knees crying to the Lord Jesus with tears and feeling like things were utterly impossible. And in those moments, you feel like there's nothing you can do. It is only the Lord Jesus who can, who can come in. And, you know, there's trust there. Those of you on this call, and I know there are who have children, you know what I'm talking about. And, you know, I think sometimes the Lord brings his situations into our life that appear to be impossible and very, very difficult and without answers because he needs to show us that he is the one that is in control, not me. I'm privileged to be able to depend on him, but he is the one who is working all things according to his will. Now, the second thing, so much I could touch on there, but I just want to mention that. The second thing, so we touched on faith, as you might say, man's side. I am asked to exercise faith in my Christian life is obedience, is obedience. And, you know, to me, a verse that really brings us uh, home is, is John chapter 15. I want to just read John 15 for a moment. And look at that. It tells us in John 15 and verse 10. Notice this. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Here's something that's very interesting. Obedience is connected with the enjoyment of the love of the Lord Jesus. As we obey him in our Christian life, we enjoy more his love. And, you know, when you think about this, it makes perfect sense. If I am disobedient to the Lord Jesus in my life, it mars communion. It's sin. And anything that mars communion takes away from my appreciation of the love of the Lord Jesus. The more I exercise obedience in my Christian life, the more I will grow in my understanding and appreciation of the love of the Lord Jesus. Let me read that verse again. It's so important. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. And so I'd like to just talk for a couple of minutes um, on, the, on this. And I want to speak about it in terms of two spheres in life. One sphere has to do with our relationships with people. 
And the second has to do with roles that we occupy in life. You know, when we talk about obedience, we sometimes, we think about the law. Oh, thou shalt do this, thou shalt uh, not do this. And that is absolutely not what we are talking about here today. You know, I'll just give you a couple of examples. We have, you have relationships as husband and wife. Here's a challenge. Husbands, love your wife. Love your wife. That's a challenge for me. I have that challenge. When my wife is having a bad day and she's perhaps a little bit grumpy or cranky, do I love my wife by exercising, you might say, divine love and choosing to love, even though things may not be feeling so good at the moment? Or do I react and take things personally in some way? I'm disobedient if I don't choose to love in that circumstance. Here's another one. It tells us in 1 John chapter 3 that we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. If someone in the assembly asks us to do something at a very inconvenient day or time that we don't like to do, and we choose, we say, no, we don't, we can't do that. We have other things that have to do with our own pleasure. Really, we're being disobedient. We're not exercising that love and care for our brethren that we ought to. That mars the enjoyment of the Lord's love for, for me. Another one. It says another sphere that we occupy in life is to be in the world. We're in the world, but not of it. And we are to be lights in this world. Am I a light in the world? Am I letting it shine when I'm at work? Or what I'm doing on Friday night or whatever the case might be. You know, these are very small, basic examples of what obedience looks like in the Christian life. And in another one, it says that we are to be subject one to another. One of the things that I think we all struggle with is that if someone comes to me and they say, brother or sister, you know, I'm concerned about something that I see or something that you've done or said, regardless of whether we think they are correct or not, do we get defensive? Does our back go up? And I have been really thinking a lot about this lately because any form of defensiveness is a sin. And we need to judge that. And if we do not judge those kinds of things in our life, we stop enjoying the love of the Lord Jesus. We should be subject one to another in that way. And like this is a whole meeting in and of itself. But this concept of obedience goes much, much deeper than things like, did you go to the meeting this week or not? It touches every relationship in my life, in my family, in the assembly, in my conduct with the world. How do we speak of authorities? Are we obedient to the scriptures and how we speak of authorities? It says there in, in Jude that even, even the archangel durst not bring railing accusation against Satan. And yet, how often we find that we are subject to bringing railing accusation where we should not. You know, roles that we occupy, I touched on the role uh, of faith. Um, and so very often with jobs or as parents or with respect to the assembly, what assembly we should go to, maybe if we move or whatever. Do we ask the question, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? That was the first thing that Paul, on the road to Dam Damascus, when he was struck down, first question he asked, Lord, what would you have me to do? And so when it comes to work, do I ask that question, Lord, should I take that, should I take that promotion? Lord, is this the, the partner, the spouse that you would have for me? Lord, is this the place where I would, would you would have me live? Do we ask him those questions? Do we follow him in that way? You know, there's something that we all do, and myself included, is that when we ask the Lord something, we often don't want 
the answer because we're afraid of what the answer means. Oh, if I move to this particular place, I'm going to be lonely or I'm going to have to live with somebody I don't like or whatever. But there's also the exercise of faith there that we need to trust the Lord for the outcome. If he says go, it doesn't matter what the implications of go look like. We can trust him for everything that happens afterwards. Hudson Taylor, when he went to China and founded the China Inland Missing, he had no idea what he was getting into, but he knew that the Lord wanted him to go and he trusted the Lord. And there was tremendous blessing as a result. And so this is the exercise of scripture of faith in the Christian life. And so I'm going to move on and give an example and then we'll close. So I just want to recap on God's side. There's his purposes for us. There's who we are as sons of God and joint heirs with Christ. We're destined to behold the glory of the Lord Jesus for all of eternity. On my side, as I go through the Christian life, in every relationship that I have, and in every role that I occupy, am I exercising faith in order that I can see the hand of the Lord Jesus in my life? And, am I, and am, I, am I obedient to him in all of those things? You know, we often speak about the need of prayer and reading. And this is why, because as I become familiar with the scriptures and I ponder them, I learn more and more about what the Lord Jesus would have for me in my life down here. You know, I want to just one quick other comment because I've been exercised about this lately in connection with obedience and some of the things that come from that. I do feel very often that we are obedient, but we're not obedient in a way that pleases the Lord. And let me give you an example. If you were to turn to Colossians chapter 4 or Ephesians chapter 5, you would see their instructions to servants to please their masters and to obey their masters. And in those passages, you would see that it says, as unto the Lord not as men pleasers. I don't go to work and obey my employer because it's the right thing to do. I do it because I want to honor the Lord Jesus in my life. It actually says the same thing in connection with subjection to husbands. Because I can be a pretty difficult person to deal with sometimes. My wife is asked to be sub, um, subject as unto the Lord because it's him. And he is the one that we are to be motivated to please in everything in our life. In everything in my life, me as a husband, I do all things. Everything I should be doing do is with reference to the Lord. Is it that way in the assembly? Am I exercising my gift in the assembly because I want people to hear my gift? That I want the accolades of my brethren? Or am I exercising my gift because... I feel that this is something that the Lord Jesus has asked me to do, irrespective of whether people uh, like it or say that they like it or whatever the case might be. These are difficult things, but this is the importance of obedience as unto the Lord. And so let's move on now. I'd like to give an Old Testament example just to illustrate this, I had three, but I'm only going to cover one that I think is of real interest. And it's the case of the Rechabites. Um, and then we'll close. What I'd like to do is first turn to 2 Kings chapter 10. Second Kings chapter 10. And I want to read verse 15. And this is uh, Ahab. So the he in verse 15 is Ahab. When he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said to him, Is thy heart right, as my heart is with thy heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. If it be, give me thy hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up to him into the chariot. And 
let's just go down now to um, verse 17, I guess this next verse. And when he came to Samaria, he slew all that remained unto Ahab and Samaria till he had destroyed him, according to the saying of the Lord, which he spoke to Elijah. And then verse 23, Jehu went and Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, into the house of Baal and said unto the worshipers of Baal, search and look that there be here with you none of the servants of the Lord, but the worshipers of Baal only. Now, you're probably wondering, what, why did I read this passage? I wanted to give the context of who Jonadab, the son of Rechab, was. And this little story is very important. He gets a front row seat to Jehu, who was commissioned by God to purge Israel of Baal worship and all the descendants of the wicked king Ahab. And so Jehu here, he's fulfilling that mandate to get rid of all of Ahab's descendants and get rid of Baal worship in the land. And it's a gruesome thing. And he asks John and Adab, the son of Rechab, to come along and observe what he's doing. And I'd like to now link that to Jeremiah chapter 35, where John Adab is mentioned again. And we can only really just touch a little bit on this. And we're going to start at verse 5. I'll read a few of the verses here. It says, I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites pots full of wine and cups. And I said unto them, drink ye wine. But they said, we will drink no wine. For John and Ab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, Ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. Neither shall ye build house, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any. But all your days ye shall dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. Thus have we obeyed the voice of John and Ab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he has charged us to drink no wine all our days, we, our wives, our sons, nor our daughters, nor to build houses for us to dwell in. Neither have we vineyard, nor field, nor seed, but we have dwelt in tents, according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. But it came to pass, when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up unto the land, that we said, Come, let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans, and for fear of the army of the Syrians. So we dwell at Jerusalem. And then I'm just going to read um, verse 18. And Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Because ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father, and kept all his precepts, and done according unto all that he has commanded you, therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. I just want to very quickly summarize this little story, very quickly. The Rechabites, if you trace them all the way back, they trace back to Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. They were Midianites in the beginning. And it appears that they came up out of the land of Midian with the Israelites. And it tells us in sec in First Chronicles, I believe, that some of them lived, um, settled down near Jericho, because it tells us there that they came up out of the city of palm trees, which was Jericho, and they settled in the north of, of Israel, which incidentally, it was the northern kingdom that Rechab, uh, sorry, uh, Jonadab and, and Jehu, we're, we're dealing with in, in 2 Kings chapter 10. So John Adab, he knew that this was his heritage. He had come up out of Midian, and he had come up from that region around Jericho, and he was privileged and blessed to enjoy 
the riches of God's blessing upon the Israelites in the land of Canaan. And we find in this story, 2 Kings 10, that he sees the results of Israelites who had settled down in the land of Israel and forgotten who God was and turned to idols as a result of that. And what happened? They died. They lost their lives. He was undoubtedly sickened by what he saw Jehu had to do there. And I have no doubt that in his mind, he, he thought to himself, this is what happens when people forget the God of Israel and settle down into a life of ease rather than remembering where they came from. And I have no doubt that it was that experience with Jehu that led him to say that his family was not to drink wine, which speaks of pleasure, and that they were to dwell in tents for all, for all time afterwards, because he did not want his family to fall into that life of ease and pleasure. To lose, he did not want them to lose the sense of their, we don't belong here, but we have been blessed by God by building houses and just taking it easy. And so this was his command to his family. And is this not what the Lord Jesus would want? He doesn't want us to lose a sense of the blessing that he has purposed for us. He doesn't want us to settle down into this world in and live in pleasure and feel like this is all there is there's nothing more beyond this world because the results of that are destructive to the christian's enjoyment of the lord jesus and his love and who god is and all that he has done in sending his son that we could be holy and blameless before him in love for all of eternity and so these children these descendants of john and Ab the Rechabite, they were obedient. They were obedient all through the ages. 200 years later, we find them here in Jeremiah's time, still obedient to what their father asked them to do. And, you know, I have no doubt that in the same vein, they exercise faith all through this. Was this easy to live this way? I'm sure that they were questioned over and over again. Here is a test put before them. Drink wine. No, we can't do that. Why are you living this way? Everybody else has houses. Why are you living in tents and acting like strangers? John and Ab, our father, who came up out of the land of Midian, he asked that we would do this. And you know, God rewarded them for that. The promise was that they would, notice how it's put in the chapter, not want a man to stand before me. In other words, you might say in the presence of God, in his presence forever. Another thing that's very touching here is that when trouble came in Jeremiah's time, these Rechabites, they didn't run to Egypt. In fact, if you read the book of Jeremiah, that's what you find the children of Israel doing in this book. They go down to the land of Egypt to get themselves out of trouble. It was a mistake. What do the Rechabites do? They go up to Jerusalem. They go up to God's divine center, and that's where they go. They valued they valued the presence of the Lord Jesus. And so, I, you know, that's a summary. You know, if we go back to the question, what is our mission in life? You know, you could put it this way. The Lord said when he met Peter, follow me, follow me. That's both a command, you might say, a call to obey and a call to trust, to exercise faith. To follow the Lord requires faith in this life. But it's me. It's the person. Everything that I do down here should be with a view to getting to know the Lord Jesus in a deeper and personal way. Because my destiny, my purpose is that I would be before him in love to the praise of his glory and to enjoy his glory for all of eternity. And when we look at our lives in that way, it should guide everything if i am struggling with career and ambitions and wanting things of this world remember remember who you are and remember 
why why you were made and have that affect the choices that you make. I don't think that we should ever, ever say that we should, that you should take this career or not this, not this career. Some people are called to high places. Some people are called for different tasks that are in the world's eyes, very low in God's sight. They're all the same. What he desires is that in all of these roles that we play in life and the relationships that we are in, that we do it all as to him and for him and to enjoy him. And if we find those things are hindering our relationship with the Lord Jesus in some way, we need to go before him and ask him why that is. So thank you for this opportunity. Maybe we'll just close in prayer. Lord Jesus, this was said very feebly, but we just want to give thanks so much for all that has been done for us. Help us to trust you in our lives, to be obedient to you, and to think about this glorious destiny, this future that we have in front of us, to behold thy beauty and thy glory, to enjoy thy love for all of eternity. We pray, Lord Jesus, for each one on this call, that, Lord, you would just bless your word to them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So Grace told me that people sometimes stay on afterwards. Um, oh, yes. Uh, we would stay uh, two more minutes, I don't know, uh, to discuss a little more of the topic for other brothers to participate also. And, uh, yeah, we, we thank you, brother, if you stay just a few more minutes. For sure, Lena. Thank you very much for the topic. Uh, those are, as I see it, very important things to be reminded of as of the general purpose of every one of us. I believe also that when we think of purpose in life, we also think of a special purpose we might have among our, our brethren. If we have any any special work to do for the Lord here. And we can see it by the gifts and all. But of course, it, it's foundational to live for the Lord. And without this, there's no way we will get to individual purposes. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And I've, Leonardo, I struggle with that question myself. Um, speaking very personally, where I live is very lonely. The nearest assembly is 600 miles away from where I live. And um, seven hour drive to get to the nearest assembly and have to get on a plane to go most, most places. And I asked the question, Lord, what's your purpose? What's your purpose for me? And sometimes I think that it really comes down to just a day by day walk with the Lord. He can show you in the assembly that you're in for today or tomorrow, what it is he desires for you in your Christian life. It, I think, and, and I've come to realize that it isn't about what I do. It's about his purpose for me and him drawing me closer to him in relationship with him. And I think, you know, I would just encourage you that um, the Lord, uh, he can show you. He can absolutely show you what that is. But the most important thing of all is that that relationship with him. And um, if, he, if that's right, he can show you exactly what, what you, you need to do in your local assembly. And I think if you start with the relationship, then the Lord will guide you to the purpose for where you are. Um, I've looked back in my Christian life 
And in the moment, I have often not been able to see, Lord, why did you have this or that happen to me? And then I look back and I can see that the Lord put this person in my life and that person in my life and that he had a purpose in those things. And I don't realize it till after they've left my life or they've gone somewhere. Um, so I would just encourage you that if, if you cultivate that walk with the Lord, he'll, he'll make it known. I know he will. Amen. Uh, Sean, I, I very much enjoyed your talk and, um, I also enjoy your brother's talk, I think, <laughs> but, um, I really, I really treasure what you've just said about it starting with the relationship you have with the Lord and that, that, that everything grows from that. When you were introducing the purpose of, of your life, you, you, you said it was for God's pleasure that you were created, um, that he would have, um, and it was it was for him, and that and when you look at it that way, it sounds very selfish that you're the center of of his purposes. And but the way I look at it is, you have a uh, like a tree that branches that that reach out to things around you, people around you. What you you do in your life is is, is fruit for the Lord, and um, it's as much for everything that comes out of your life and every effect it has, it's not just a selfish, self-contained thought about yourself. It's, it's, it's how Sean reaches out, does God's will in every way all around him. So it's the, it's the big picture. You're just maybe the instrument that he uses to, to do these things. So I look at it a little bit broader than, just being self-centric but i really appreciated that you put the relationship before everything else because um i think it's in extremely easy just to do things because you think that the lord would want them to be done but without seeing it being born out of um it really being his will so I really enjoyed that that thought about being in communion and getting it getting it right. Douglas, just in connection with what you just said, um, God working out His purposes you through you might say the fruit that comes in from my life, and that fruit is not me; it's the new life that He's given me in the power of the Spirit of God that produces that fruit. But there's a I've enjoyed this verse so much in Philippians 12 and two, chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. And I'll just quickly read it. It says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, note this verse. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And I've always enjoyed that because that's those two verses give my side and God's side that as Lord of my life, as I seek to obey him in my life, I should tremble, not in the fear of it, but in the knowledge that in my life, God, in everything I do, God is working out his purposes, his will for his good pleasure and that is just an amazing fact um when things go wrong god is working through me um in all of those things ultimately to accomplish his pleasure and you know it reminds us of that verse it is god um all things work together for good to them that love god and so i think those those two verses just came to me as you as you said that douglas thank you yeah, and, and likewise, I, I, I also experience an element of isolation, but somebody's got to be in these places. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of work needs doing, and God put, put you there. So good on you, you know, keep it up. <laughs> Thank you.
Brother Sean, you mentioned two other incidences that you instances that you didn't have time to bring before us. I sure appreciated the Rechabites. Um, and I know becoming a grandpa, that's going to be increasingly uh, before your soul. Um, children's children are the glory of old men. Uh, I remember my grandfather saying, you know, your your children may may continue on somewhat with your exercises because they were right directly under you. But the real test will be if your grandchildren continue on with them, then you will know really how much they were of the Lord and how much they really possessed your own soul. But mm. I want to know what the other two instances, just so we could look at them on our own. Well, uh, Daniel and his three companions, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Um, and then I was, and really the Lord is the ultimate example. You know, it's a fruitful thing just to look at the Lord's life as the as the perfect example of these things so those were the two things um but from a new testament old testament example it was, it was daniel and his companions that i was thinking of okay thank you if you hear piano music in the background you may not be able to hear it in my my daughter's practicing the piano above me, so. <laughs> We've been hearing it for quite some time, but it's not uh, bothering at all. Okay. I thought that was just background music you had added. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a piano lesson time, so. Yes, I'll say, I'll, uh, I'll say hello to Lynn. Thank you for that. She was busy during the meeting because the uh, washing machine broke down about two weeks ago. And so the repairman had come to the house today. We've been doing all our laundry at our daughter's house the last two weeks. 